Hi there folks, welcome back to my channel and yeah this is another video that I'm recording from the safety of my flat. Uh, I do have a backlog of other videos that I've filmed at the end of last year and start of this year before this whole lockdown happened. So it was last week, last Monday, when I realised that I'd missed a trick. That I essentially should have done this video last week. Because last Monday was the 6th of April 2020. Which would mean that, that it was the 700th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Abroath. And I'm not too sure how well known the Declaration of Abroath is outside Scotland, but it's kind of quite a well known document in Scotland itself. So, can I give you a wee kind of quick brief history? Essentially, in the late 13th century, I guess uh, uh, we had the end of the Canmore dynasty in Scotland. So, essentially, Alexander III died in 1286. Essentially, he had been travelling back home, back, I think it was back to Stirling, in order to be with his young French wife. Because uh, he wanted to perform his kingly duties, because he was needing a male heir. The only heir he had was a young princess, a, Nor a young Norwegian princess, who was his granddaughter. She was called Margaret, the Maid of Norway. But he wanted a male heir in order to kind of continue the family line. But it was a very, very dark, stormy night, and he'd actually been advised not to travel f from where it was he was staying to where his wife was. Because his, his advisors were scared that something was going to happen. He ignored their advice and went travelling anyway with a small retinue of his men. And unfortunately, in the darkness of the night and in the storm, he gets split up from his men. And it was the next morning when they were actually able to go back out and search for him. The, on the shore of the Firth of Forth, just below the cliffs at Kinghorn, which is in the Kingdom of Fife, they found Alexander III's body. During the storm the night before, he had essentially been thrown from his horse and he got thrown over the edge of the cliff and met his end when he his body kind of hit the, the 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 shores of the river and so that meant that Scotland was left with a, a three year old heir, heir presumptive and but then again she was at Margaret who was then at that time the uncrowned Queen of Scots was in Norway and she was three years old and it was in 1290 when she was deemed old enough to travel to Scotland to her new kingdom that she essentially set off in order to kind of be crowned Queen of Scots Unfortunately, she got within distance of Scotland. She actually got to Orkney. And it has to be remembered at this time, Orkney was actually part of Norway. It was actually under Norwegian control. At this time, it was, Orkney was not a Scottish island. So Margaret got to the furthest reaches of her father's kingdom. She could literally see Scotland from where she was but she was ill she, could, she couldn't go any further and unfortunately she never left Orkney alive she actually died while she was there so she died within sight of her new kingdom so this left Scotland without a monarch so as far at that time it was viewed that only God could choose a king, only God could choose a monarch. But that line had failed. So then the Scottish nobles had decided to, to turn to the nearest 
God appointed war, uh, monarch to, in order to help out with, with the situation that they were in. And that just happened to be Edward Longshanks, who was Edward the First of England. And for those who have watched Braveheart, this was the bad English king from Braveheart. So he came up, chose from the claimants who were there, and chose someone called John Balliol. And part of the reason why he chose John Balliol is because he viewed Balliol as being somebody who would do as they were told. He was essentially putting a puppet on the throne of Inc- on the throne of Scotland. So, th- kind of that all kind of led into the war of in- the, the the first Scottish war of independence. And yeah, so that shit uh, I think officially started in twelve ninety six. And I, it's the the actual war itself is kind of officially seen as being ended in 1314 at the Battle of Bannockburn but legally finishing in 1329 with the Treaty of Northumbria I mean I was I'll just double double check that and be back in a second yeah I've just went and checked and according to the internet it was saying that the first Scottish War of Independence was officially ended with the signing of the, the Treaty of Edinburgh in Northampton in 1328. So that would mean that the Scottish War of the first Scottish War of Independence lasted for just a bit of math here, 98, isn't it? For so it was 32 years. That the first war continued for but again that is kind of going to be a topic for another video because yeah, again it was a very kind of complicated kind of event that was going on well, anyway uh, that was with the signing of Edinburgh and Northampton that would, was eight years after the signing of the Declaration of Arbroath and with the Declaration of Arbroath it was essentially in response to the Pope at the time, who was John the Twenty Second, who was trying to put pressure on Scotland to sign a truce with England. And essentially the declaration of a broth is this letter that said essentially sent to the Pope, who was actually uh, in France at the time. Uh, he wasn't actually staying in in the Vatican in Rome. And it was essentially stating that Scotland was an independent and sovereign nation and was separate from England. And was essentially kind of declaring that Robert the Bruce was the King of Scots. And it does have to be remembered at this time it was the title was King of Scots not King of Scotland, because the king or the monarch was seen as being the, the king or monarch of the people, not the land. And I'm pretty sure from what I can remember reading of the, the actual declaration itself, uh, sorry, just a, just a sign and going by there, uh, it actually does state in the declaration that if the king goes against the wishes of the people, then or at that time it would have been the, the nobles of Scotland, that they would essentially depose him and put somebody else on the throne. Which, for at that time, was actually kind of quite a, a radical way of looking at it. It's quite kind of a radical kind of stance that the, the Scottish nobles took there. But the most famous quote that a lot of people actually do kind of come out with in relation to the Declaration of Arbroath, and goes as such, okay, this is a translation. It's not my translation. It's a translation that I have kind of come across through kind of reading kind of different books. And it essentially goes, for so long as 100 men remain alive, we shall never, never under any condition 
submit to the dominance of the English. It is not for glory or for riches that we fight, but for liberty, which no good man will submit to lose, but with his life. So it's kind of quite quite stirring you know, when you actually kind of look at a lot of the, the, the language that was used in the document itself. And so this is essentially seen as being Scotland's declaration of independence. Essentially it's kind of stating that Scotland was independent, sovereign and defined Scotland's right to use military action when unjustly attacked. So essentially saying that, yeah, this is ours. <laughs> like, if they can go away, Scotland's ours. And, but unfortunately it wasn't until the 17th century that the declaration of a broth was kind of started to become kind of more recognised. Even in Scotland, like, before the 17th century, it wasn't really kind of viewed as being a major document and I think it was first printed in English just after the Glorious Revolution which is when William of Orange came over and kind of took the throne of Britain and I think it's kind of a contrast from what I've read it was at this time that it started to be viewed as being a declaration of independence and it has actually been argued that the Declaration of Abroth was one of the main influences on the writing of the American Declaration of Independence. Uh, but that's kind of one of those kind of things that's like, there are some historians that argue and say that it was an influence on the American Declaration of Independence. And there's other historians who turn around saying, no, it wasn't, it wasn't it. It has nothing to do with the American De- Declaration of Independence. It's a completely different document. But I have to admit, I kind of quite like the idea of it being kind of... Ha- having this wider reach, this kind of wider influence. Uh, but unfortunately, I think it was like the original copy of the letter that was sent to the Pope in Avignon in France has since been lost and but fortunately uh, there was actually copies made of the letter and the only existing manuscript copy of the declaration is actually kept in the, the Scot- Scotland State Papers which is actually kept within the National Archive of Scotland in Edinburgh. So it's kind of, even though it's not the original letter, it's still a, a kind of medieval kind of manuscript copy of the letter that was sent. And the, the actual tra- in- translation that a lot of people use when it's been translated to English was actually uh, translated by a guy called Sir James Ferguson, who was actually a former Keeper of the Records of Scotland. And, yeah. So I think kind of the actual copy that we still have today of the Declaration is very much kind of kept under lock and key, which it should be. And it is very much kind of protected and looked after and kind of kept safe. But I think, hopefully, if I do get up to a broth this year, uh, from what I remember from the last time I was up, they actually had a copy of the declaration kept within a secure glass case, within a display, within the actual kind of monastery itself. Because it was a broth abbey, which had been part of the the, the monastery at broth, was where the, de- the declaration was signed. Because uh, if I remember correctly, it had been signed within the church itself. So that in itself makes a Broth Abbey 
and the monastery at Broth and Broth itself as a town, as the town for the abbey, an historically important location. And it's one of those kind of places that, yet a lot of people kind of know about Bannockburn, they know about Stirling, they know about Edinburgh as being these historically important places in Scotland. But a broth is so often overlooked and not really paid much attention to. So hopefully, if, even though this was a really, just a really brief overview and discussion of the declaration of a broth, and hopefully it's kind of whet your appetite for kind of maybe finding out a wee bit more about what was going on. And I probably will try and kind of touch more on it in, in later videos. I will try and talk a wee bit more about the first Scottish War of Independence and the, Sc the second Scottish War of Independence and maybe try and expand on things a wee bit more but so this period in Scottish history is quite quite a, quite a lot of turmoil and politics and different things going on so it's never kind of the clean cut simple kind of black and white thing that's going on that you, 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 that you tend to see in a lot, a lot of movies. Uh, there's a lot of kind of political manoeuvring, it's a lot of, kind of people who are wanting control, who are wanting you know, like, to support one faction or a lot of people changing and shifting sides. So maybe this could be a kind of, a wee kind of mini series within this kind of larger series itself. Uh, but hopefully I haven't rambled too much <laughs> and hopefully you've, you've enjoyed what you've heard and hopefully you all enjoy what I'm going to po post in the future and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye bye.